Hi, my name is Brian Dyer. I'm the Senior Acquisitions Editor at Baker Academic. And today I'm going to be talking with Brendan Byrne, uh, who is Professor Emeritus at the University of Divinity at Melbourne, Australia, has authored many books, including the forthcoming book from Baker Academic, Paul and the Economy of Salvation. And uh, so, Brendan, I thought just to begin with, uh, you talk a little bit in the preface about how this book came together, but tell me a little bit about uh, your history with this topic um, and how um, it resulted in the book that we have coming out this summer. Yes, well, Brian, I have been uh, teaching and researching on Paul for, for nearly uh, four decades, really. and. Uh, this book is sort of a distillation, a coming together of my thoughts on Paul, not in every area of Paul, but uh, in, in many of the central areas, especially those that have been a matter of contest and disputation between Catholics and Protestants since the, the Reformation, I suppose. I've, I've always been teaching in an ecumenical situation with colleagues from uh, from the uh, Episcopalian or the Anglican Church, and also especially from the uh, Uniting Church, which is a combination of the Presbyterian and Methodist churches and the Congregational churches. They have been my close colleagues, and so I've been in dialogue with them uh, all over those years. We've co-taught and so forth. So uh, it, that I found, it's a wonderful thing uh, as a Catholic to teach uh, Bible in 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 uh, a Protestant when you've got Protestants in the class because Catholics tend to be a bit uh, coy about that, but it gives it a great deal of stimulus. So uh, my first when I was basically studying theology uh, began that as a as an undergraduate. I, I was the question that bugged me was, you know, the soteriological question: How is it that Christ's death saves us? How are we connected? And uh, I went away to do doctoral studies at Oxford with that question in mind. Now, it has never been, didn't work that my doctoral studies went in a different direction. But um, that question has remained with me. And uh, I hope I have shed, found some solution to that in, in this book. I'll talk about that a bit, a bit later. Um, the other aspect that has evolved more recently has been a recognition of that Paul is very much an apocalyptic thinker. I don't go so far in that direction as, as say, Lou Martin or Douglas Campbell, but I, I, people like um, uh, 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 Baker and uh, the Paul the Apostle and, and Kaiserman, I, I think they uh, brought Pauline studies back to a proper centre by their emphasis on the apocalyptic nature of Paul. And... Uh, I've spent, in, in the course of my doctorate, I did spend a semester in Rome reading all through the post-biblical apocalyptic uh, literature of Judaism. I'd already done a master's on Qumran. So I was absolutely convinced that those, that that literature, uh, the apocalyptic is the apocalyptic matrix of Paul's thought. And he had to graft his discovery of Christ into that and, and radically alter it, but nonetheless, it remains the, the matrix of his, of his um, theological thought. So, uh, and as th that, uh, I became more and more convinced of that, I also became aware that the last judgment is a very prominent theme in, in Jewish apocalypticism and that it's the background against which issues, questions of righteousness and justification must be considered. Uh, I, I disagreed, I think, with Carl Donfried, who said that we, in a footnote somewhere, that we must understand the last judgment in Paul in the light of justification and, and righteousness. I think it's exactly the other way around. And uh, in some ways, this book was sparked off by that comment of his. Uh, 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 that was the, the spark that that set it going, in a in a conference at which I was uh, asked to live to to make two papers conference on Romans. So that's that's really where it it has um, the genesis of the book uh, to look at central themes to to work through central themes in Paul's theology uh, from that perspective of the last judgment. I mean, 
it's interesting when you teach Romans, which has been my preoccupation, I suppose, very much. Uh, it's it's wonderful. You know, the first seventeen verses are marvelous. You know, and you get to the theme of the of Romans, the um, revelation of, of the righteousness of God is the power of of God leading to salvation for every believer. That's great. And then suddenly, next question, because the wrath of God is revealed. And that starts a very unpleasant part of Romans, really, to teach. But, you know, I I realised, came to realise now, this is is the whole background against which the, the revelation of God's righteousness in the gospel is proclaimed. There's this wrath there. Uh, I, perhaps I should stop stop it for a moment and let you have a say, but uh, that's it, it's it's that background. And if you go through, uh, and instead of, although there have been some good monographs written on The Last Judgment in Paul recently, I decided that, I, and also on the apocalyptic literature, I decided that I had to read it for myself. So I read again through all that literature, uh, through the in, in Jewish post biblical apocalyptic literature and Qumran literature, looking for this theme of the last judgment, and it's very prominent. And also, then I sat down with the, the seven uh, undisputed letters of Paul and read through them very carefully. And you find again and again, I think, that um, every all this is written with the, the horizon against the horizon of the looming last judgment. Well, talk a little bit about um, how looking at justification and righteousness through the lens of the last judgment influences how we understand them. And in particular, I'm curious about uh, you in, You kind of grapple with the idea of, um, I'm going to say it wrong, but um, two different justifications or two time, two different times of justification and um, and is that what Paul is trying to communicate or is it not? And you kind of grapple with um, that question. So uh, how do those things, how do we, how do they come better into focus uh, when we keep the last judgment at kind of the, the forefront? Well, well, first of all, I think we have to understand, and I think Stephen Westerholm, the Canadian scholar, has, has brought this out very clearly. When we're talking about justification for Paul, uh, we're talking, it's the same concept as he, uh, as he discussed with his Jewish colleagues. I mean, it's not, it's, there's a basic sense of justification and righteousness that he shares with, with apocalyptic Judaism. And what he shares with them is the fact that uh, the last judgment is, is, is coming. Uh, for him, it's much more imminent than for them, I suppose. But, and the, the question is, the righteousness and justification arise out of that. How am I going to be found at at the last judgment am i going to be declared righteous or not uh now the mode in which as a as a believer in christ um that my my being declared found righteous the prospect of being found righteous uh the mode has totally changed because it's it's this extraordinary it's because of this extraordinary intervention by god in the person of the son that has created a righteousness for me uh, that was unforeseen in the well, maybe there is a bit of promise in the uh, in, in purely Jewish speculation or anticipation, but uh, that 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 is where it, where it is coming from. But the question of ju- that justification, of course, was was still expected at the end. Uh, of end of time in, in um, apocalyptic Judaism. Now, Paul the Christian, oh, we, it's an anachronistic to call him that, but let's call him that. After his discovery of Christ, he is brought before in the gospel. The gospel brings the last judgment forward. It presents you with, with in, in some ways it presents you with the wrath, but at the same moment, at the same time, it invites you through faith to, uh, to enter into union with Christ and in him find righteousness, find the eschatological justification. However, God didn't keep the strict apocalyptic rules. God intervened first and the, the 
and the there was a kind of a 11th hour rescue, if you like, of, of humanity in Christ. Um, but the last judgment is still uh, to be wrapped up in, in the world. So what has been created by God in his intervention in Christ is what James Dunn, I think, has very helpfully called the overlap time, the time between when we are already through faith and baptism and the gift of the spirit, we are already in the new creation. We are post judged But on the other hand, um, the remnants of the old age are still there to be, to be wound up and our bodies are still physically uh, tied to that. We are, it'll only, for Paul, it'll only be all complete when we share fully the resurrection of Christ. So there's this anomalous overlap time never foreseen, I think, in apocalyptic Judaism. And it's that fact that we sort of, the judgment is already, and yet it's, there's an aspect in which it's not yet. So we are righteous, but um, we have to somehow live out that righteousness and preserve it because there's, there's still the last judgment in some ways still to come. It, it's, a, it's a huge theological issue, uh, the, the fact that we are, the judgment is already and, and is, is not yet. But what I think we have to realise is that Christian theology has been taken that overlap period uh, as normative. We just take it as, as that's because that's the way that's what we've been living in for the last 2000 years. For Paul, I think it was a totally provisional thing that was only going to last. I don't know when he thought the Perusia would come, but I think it was pretty clear uh, that it wasn't going to be long. So in some ways, all our theology has been provisional for Paul and uh, he hasn't got it all worked out, all sorted out because there just wasn't time to do that. Uh, and he had other things to do. The main thing, I think, was to proclaim as far as what, around the world uh, the gospel so that those that God had chosen would respond positively for salvation. So, so let me... Uh, go on, yeah. So uh, jumping on um, the the phrase that you mentioned of in this provisional time um, yeah. and uh, believers um, needing to live out that righteousness. To yeah. so talk a little bit about, there we're getting into some interesting kind of theological discussions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so um, talk a little bit about in Paul's thinking, what does that, what does that mean? If there's, there's a certain kind of um, through Christ, God uh, intervening, uh, declaring um, uh, believers righteous, but needing yeah. to live in that righteousness because they have yet to yes. um, stand before God in the, the, the yes. final judgment. So, so in that time, what is, what is, um, what, yeah, how, how should we understand what believers should be doing or their role in this whole process uh, in that time? Well, well, this is where one of my, I think, distinctive aspects would come through and where the, the Catholic Brendan Byrne would come through uh, in the sense that uh, I, I believe, I, well, what I get particularly from that Jewish apocalyptic background is the sense of an intrinsic link between righteousness and salvation, uh, righteousness and justification, uh, that a righteousness understood in in with an ethical aspect to it of, of righteousness is living according to a norm that God is requiring. And uh, that I believe is, is going to, is, is having an intrinsic, uh, there's a causal link to, to put it that way between how we live and how we end up at the last judgment. Uh, that I suppose it, I'm emphasizing there the, the, the Catholic sense of that. Um, as Paul Rainbow has pointed out, uh, I think the, to account for the obedience required of believers post justification has always been a problem in, for Protestants. I'm not suggesting the Catholics don't have problems with Paul, but um, that has always been a problem. And it has been something that the Catholic tradition has tended to emphasize. Now, while doing that, 
I would say, emphasize very strongly that uh, post-justification, to live out justification, uh, we have the gift of the spirit. And the spirit is, for Paul, I think, not very much distinct from the impact of the risen Lord in the community, in, in Christ. And so all our works really are not ours. They are ours because they work in our bodies through us, in our bodily life. However, they are utterly dependent on the grace of God given us by the Spirit. That's why I think, um, Paul, uh, that, that if you emphasize sufficiently the, uh, the work of the Spirit within believers, you can escape away from a sense of a works righteousness that is somehow um, making a demand upon God to reward us or, or, or something like that. Uh, and at, towards the end of the book, I, I quote quite a couple of Protestant scholars and so forth who say, I, I think quite rightly, that it's not as if the, the question of righteousness by faith replaces judgment by works in Paul. In fact, judgment by works is the presupposition against which, well, not against which, but within which um, God's gracious intervention in Christ uh, takes place. So you don't have to play these two principles off against one another. Uh, they, the, the latter, the justification by faith and grace and faith, it presupposes justification by, by works. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. what I'd say. Now, I suppose you, 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 may, you may have been going to mention, I do bring up this uh, bogeyman of Sunnijism a bit. Uh, and I'm a bit bold on that. I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't find in Paul any worry or hesitation about Sunnijism. And I think John Barclay, not that he wants to be identified totally with my view, but that he's given us a very good definition, a number of definitions of it. And one of them, I think, fits Paul perfectly well, whereas by God remains God, and, um, but God works through believers. And um, Paul, there are statements in Paul that are very close to that. I mean, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, we are, in Greek, uh, synergoi, synergoi there, we are co-workers with God. Um, the NRSV translation tries to get away from that, but it's not, it's not right. Um, famous Philippians is God is at work in you in Philippians uh, 2, 12 to, to 13. God is at work in you. Um, and th there are other places too. So I, I'm making a bit of a bid for synergism, putting that out there. Yeah. Well, let me uh, um, ask just one last yeah. question. Um, and um, as this book um, goes out into the world yes. <laughs> in, uh, this summer, um, what what do you hope will be um, kind of the impact of it? Or as you think about student, young students who are, um, you know, starting their theological studies and and get get your book in their hands, or scholars who have been talking about Paul um, their whole lives, um, uh, reading through your book. What do you think? as far as uh, a takeaway or uh, a main contribution um, that you hope um, or an impact that, that you hope this book will have? Well, I, I would hope that it would be stimulating uh, for them. You know, I've always found, I've always taught classes uh, that are mixed as far as uh, religious traditions are concerned. And um, the, the best sort of students from the, the Protestant tradition they found my teaching rather exciting, I think, because it stimulated. It said, "You make us not. You make us question things that we've uh, just presupposed, and we've we are comfortable hearing and so forth. But you you've brought us sort of a a fresh approach, but not done it in a polemical way. But but try to look at the text again from a somewhat uh, from a different, slightly different perspective. Uh, I." I unashamedly in this book say that I think we've got to let Paul be Paul. I mean, I don't pretend that I'm looking at Paul without spectacles from my tradition and as others aren't, 
But uh, there's a huge weight of theological tradition that separates us from Paul. It's the, it's constituted the lens. And uh, I think we've got to try and put that aside and let let Paul be Paul be Paul, even if he says things that we're not not so happy with, uh, almost talk about wrath and things like that. Uh, okay, that's Paul. That's that's his world. So let him be, not try to extradite him to our world. So uh, I would just hope that I might um, stimulate students, uh, freshly from, from the Protestant tradition, to, um, to question their own uh, belief. Not that I want to convert them, but just that they may be, uh, we may be more enriched by a broader view. There are not many Roman Catholic uh, specialists in St. Paul. I mean, one thinks of uh, Joe Fitzmaier, Jean Novelletti in Rome, and uh, but by and large, uh, Catholic biblical scholars have concentrated on the Gospels. Uh, and uh, so I think this book is a bit of a rare book in some ways, and that's what I would hope that it would... Uh, um, stimulate some some interest on on those grounds, yeah. but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I challenge. Some, I don't. I think in terms of justification itself, uh, I think the Protestant view is better. Is right. Is more accurate to Paul that that it's that that's the basic declaration, and that the transformation that takes place immediately afterwards or should take place immediately afterwards is sanctification for Paul. I, th I agree with that. I think that's right. Rather than the Catholic saying, which the, the transformation is already there in justification. No, I think that's the second next thing around. Whereas um, probably on righteousness, I may be putting it itself. I may be putting an ethical aspect into it that, uh, that, that is not there in the Protestant tradition. Thanks for taking the time to talk about the book. Uh, I think it's an important book. I'm excited to yeah. see it come out. Um, and of course, we're recording this for CBA. I, I yeah. leave it up to my sales team to, um, yes. as far as offer information on how right. folks at CBA can right. get a copy of it. But um, uh, yeah. I'll just tell your, uh, anyone who views it from the United States that uh, I'm not actually sitting on a cliff top over the beach. This is, uh, this is what you can do with Zoom. But that is, a, that is the view of the Great Ocean Road in Victoria, where I live. It's a great tourist attraction. So if you want a beautiful beach and the Zoom, uh, not Zoom, the COVID restrictions finally get lifted, um, come and enjoy the Great Ocean Road. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Brian.